introduction, and uh, it's an honor to join all of you today. Uh, our story starts in early 2011, when a consensus had emerged amongst regional security analysts that the uprisings in the Arab world were devastating to al-Qaeda uh, as an organization. As The Guardian noted, shortly after the group's longtime leader, Osama bin Laden, was killed in the U.S. raid in Abbottabad that we're all familiar with, none of the uprisings that have shaken the region had involved significant Islamist activity, let alone the violent extremist jihadi ideas promoted by bin Laden, Ayman al-Zawahiri, and their ilk. The article, the Guardian article, went on to argue that the peaceful uprisings that shook the region had in fact rendered al-Qaeda irrelevant even before bin Laden's death, and that the notion that the group poses a serious challenge to the Arab regimes is dead. These words, we should note, were not written in a vacuum. Rather, they represented the dominant view of regional security analysts expressed multiple times throughout the year last year. Uh, now, due to more recent events, as this year draws to a close, uh, it's still unclear how big a regional player al-Qaeda will be. Uh, and in fact, it is possible, quite possible, that al-Qaeda won't pose a serious challenge to either the new democratic or quasi-democratic Arab regimes or the remaining authoritarians. But it's also clear that al-Qaeda had not been rendered irrelevant in the way that regional analysts predicted. In September, as we all recall, a short and poorly produced anti-Islam film called Innocence of Muslims spurred intense protests at American embassies and consulates throughout the region that often escalated into violence. Ominously, we could see al-Qaeda symbols quite prominently there in a way that they weren't during the Arab Spring uprising. Al-Qaeda flags, as this graphic demonstrates, were often waved, waved during these protests, as were also uh, flags that were similar to al-Qaeda, black flags that were similar, um, basically taking some of the aesthetics, but they weren't identical to al-Qaeda flags. Um, further, pro-al-Qaeda slogans were chanted in multiple countries. Now, these facts don't make the demonstrations, of course, al-Qaeda protests, nor do they definitively establish that al-Qaeda has re-emerged as a potent force. But what happened in September runs directly counter to what regional analysts had predicted the previous year. Analysts claimed that al-Qaeda's message and brand were marginalized by the fact that peaceful, non-Islamist protests toppled long-standing dictators like Hosni Mubarak and Tunisia's Ben Ali. Yet if al-Qaeda's brand really had been dimmed by these events, we would not be seeing its imagery and pro-al-Qaeda slogans being used as such powerful symbols of resistance against a religious affront. So let's be frank about this. The developments of the innocence of Muslims protests with al-Qaeda symbols so prominently displayed ran counter to the logic of the field's consensus. I begin with these, this introduction because this very thing has happened with alarming regularity within the field of regional security studies, as I will discuss. Not just that some analysts have misread critical developments, but rather that the entire field, with only a few outliers, reached agreement on conclusions that were either wrong or else for which insufficient evidence supported such wide agreement. What I'd like to do here is to examine two specific case studies of consensus views in regional security studies, uh, both of them related to al-Qaeda, uh, that were ill-reasoned at the time they were reached and that ultimately proved to be wrong. Now, these are just two examples in a more widespread phenomenon what I'll conclude with is a discussion of other areas where we might currently be, be seeing consensus errors at play, and also why this field might be particularly prone to these consensus errors. Understanding this dynamic is something that will help all of us as analysts and people who care about the field to avoid these errors in the future. The first of the two case studies involves the Arab awakening and jihadism. Uh, last year, the voices saying that the revolutions in the region were devastating to jihadism, and to al-Qaeda in particular, were loud and unequivocal. One view was that the Arab awakening showed al-Qaeda to be irrelevant since it was uninvolved in the revolutionary events. This line of thought frequently emphasized the fact that protesters were not hoisting al-Qaeda banners or pictures of bin Laden. 
As Rania Abazade wrote in Time, there were no banners hailing Osama bin Laden in Egypt's Tahrir Square, no photos of his deputy Ayman al-Zawahiri at anti-government protests in Tunisia, Libya, or even Yemen. Now, there's a second rationale as well. And that, that second rationale uh, for concluding that the uprisings marginalized or else killed al-Qaeda is that peaceful transitions in places like Tunisia and Egypt meant that the most important arguments on which al-Qaeda had been founded over the years were being undermined. That is, though the group was seen by many within the Arab world as a death cult, at least it stood against the regimes that were so oppressive. However, if al-Qaeda was unnecessary to change these regimes, and if violence was unnecessary to change these regimes, it could no longer make this central argument for its own necessity and its own relevance. Now, I should say, al-Qaeda's delegitimization and its defeat was one possible outcome of the Arab Spring, but it's by no means as self-evident as the consensus amongst regional analysts suggested. Uh, there are several reasons that this consensus really should have been questioned all along, at a time when so many were subscribing to it. I think these reasons are all very clear, very intuitive, and were knowable last year. And I can say this definitively, because I was making these arguments last year. Now, the first is that it was clear from the outset that another possible outcome of the Arab awakenings uh, was that al-Qaeda could take advantage of the chaos to make operational gains. A number of jihadis have either escaped or been released from prison within the region. Uh, Al-Qaeda's North African affiliate, uh, Al-Qaeda Islamic Maghreb, was also able to obtain new weaponry during the Libyan chaos. And we can see uh, the recent uh, events in Benghazi uh, really shone a light upon this. Some of the uh, networks that have been linked to the attack on uh, the U.S. consulate uh, are networks that involve people who were released from prison. Uh, including the uh, Jamal network, uh, which was is headed up by an Egyptian uh, released after the fall of Mubarak, uh, who ended up going to Libya and establishing his own network there. Uh, in fact, you had, uh, for example, Hani Asabai, a an Egyptian Islamist figure uh, who is heavily associated with the jihadi movement, releasing list after list of important jihadi figures who had been released from prisons after Mubarak's fall and in the chaos. Uh, that's one thing, the potential for operational gains through prison releases, new weaponry, and the like. Uh, a second reason this consensus view uh, should have been questioned is that al-Qaeda has always been a vanguard movement. It's always comprised a small percentage of the Muslim community, rather than being a movement that possessed massive popular support. Uh, now, it's true that al-Qaeda uh, wasn't front and center as the various regimes collapsed. But even if al-Qaeda, as I believe it would, would have liked large numbers to be on the streets chanting jihadi slogans, it doesn't require those levels of participation. Those were not the levels of participation that they had prior to the September 11th attacks. Those are not the, the levels of participation they've had over the past decade. And the fact that they're also not the levels of participation that they have now doesn't indicate an organization that has been massively weakened. A third reason is that Al-Qaeda could benefit when sky-high expectations in the Arab world go unmet. The revolts that comprised the Arab Spring were not just about democracy. And incidentally, as we can very clearly see, uh, it's not inevitable that democracy will be the, re the result in places like Egypt. Um, the, but in addition to, to their discontent with governance uh, and Mubarak's system, you have other concerns, uh, concerns about material needs, about unemployment, about food price inflation, about poverty, about empty stomachs. We can ask ourselves, will more jobs suddenly appear? Will the price of food suddenly decline? Uh, both Egypt and also Tunisia have tourism-based economies, and tourism has definitely suffered due to the instability that accompanied regime change. Egypt's unemployment has risen rather than fallen, since Mubarak fell from power. When expectations are so high, disappointment may well be enormous. And when a society's lofty expectations end up dashed, extremist ideologies have historically been able to flourish. Now, 
as I said, these points that I outlined are not exactly revolutionary. Uh, in fact, I think they're ra rather intuitive. Um, but indicating not only the widespread consensus that Al-Qaeda's decline was the only possible outcome of revolutionary events, uh, but also the personalization of, of these points. Uh, I recall a conference that I attended in the summer of 2011, the summer of last year. Uh, when I made the aforementioned arguments, um, there was a, a well-known counterterrorism analyst who was also at the conf conference and on a uh, panel before mine, uh, who was so surprised, so angered at this challenge that I made to the conventional wisdom uh, that the individual refused even to greet me or speak to me uh, after I was done presenting these points. Uh, this is an environment, I, I, and I raise this because what it indicates is an environment not only where too many people are approaching these issues in the same way, uh, but also where the analytic environment is unhealthy, something which, in my view, can be devastating for productive analysis. Um, now, of course, when we look at this today, uh, the arguments that the Arab awakening had killed al-Qaeda seem far less compelling uh, in view of what's happened over the past few months, uh, not just the protests, uh, but also the spotlight that it's shown on uh, al-Qaeda's and al-Qaeda affiliates' growth over the course of the previous two years. Um, now, the point about the lack of al-Qaeda banners during the Arab Spring protests in early 2011 has, in my view, always uh, overemphasized the absence of uh, this symbol. Uh, but if al-Qaeda banners being flown or not is the metric by which we can judge the group's strength, then surely their presence during the protests against innocence of Muslims should be seen as a significant development. Um, in addition, as I mentioned before, you also had pro-al-Qaeda chants. Um, outside the U.S. Embassy in Kuwait, for example, about 500 demonstrators chanted, Obama, we are all Osama, with us, this slogan also being heard in Cairo and Tunis and also in Qatar. Uh, now, this is not to say uh, that al-Qaeda is definitively back as a strategic adversary, nor that it will be able to execute another large-scale attack against Western interests like 9-11. But the logic of regional security experts, we can say now, was wrong. Al-Qaeda was not rendered anywhere near as marginal as they predicted that it would be. Now let's move on to uh, the second one. Um, this being uh, a case study dealing with Al-Qaeda's organizational structure. Um, following the September 11th attacks, as we all know, uh, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan in order to topple the Taliban, which had prov been providing Al-Qaeda with sanctuary. Uh, after the Taliban was toppled, uh, the consensus view amongst regional, regional security experts was that the jihadi group's central leadership had been permanently disrupted uh, and that al-Qaeda had become uh, more of an idea than an organization. Uh, again, this consensus view also proved to be wrong and had policy consequences. Um, it was, in fact, part this perception, uh, in part of this perception that al-Qaeda had been beaten that caused the United States to draw its military resources away from Afghanistan and Pakistan for use in Iraq. In turn, this process of drawing away military resources helped to supercharge al-Qaeda's regeneration. Uh, over time, al-Qaeda's central leadership actually did manage to regain capabilities. Um, it regained capabilities uh, primarily in uh, Pakistan's Fatah, uh, the federally administered tribal areas, where it had um, a somewhat complex strategy, uh, one that involved intermarriage with local tribes, uh, getting to know the power brokers, so being able to use them. Uh, its understanding of the relevant power brokers was better than that of the United States uh, or Pakistan. Seem to have lost your audio. Can you try it again? Hi, all. Can you hear me again? Yep, we've got you now. Thanks. Carry on. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I saw that that uh, that we temporarily lost temporarily lost connection there, which I guess. Uh, happens with this kind of, of setup. 
I think uh, you lost me just when I was talking about Al Qaeda in the federally administered tribal areas. Is that correct? I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Um, yes. So, uh, yes. At any rate, Al Qaeda was able to regenerate during this period in Pakistan's federally administered tribal areas. Uh, this is, of course, something that that we had difficulty measuring for a variety of reasons, uh, including the fact that. Uh, U.S. signals intelligence doesn't do a very good job of penetrating uh, what's going on in such an environment. Now, the this consensus view that Al Qaeda had become an idea, not an organization, continued past events such as the July seventh, two thousand five attacks in Britain, when you had four British-born suicide bombers blow themselves up on London's public trans transit system during rush hour, killing fifty-two. Uh, now, at the time, uh, the authorities were very hesitant to acknowledge that al-Qaeda had played a role. Uh, you had two official British reports, uh, both released the following year, which described this cell as being both autonomous and also self-actuating, rather than, than being tied to al-Qaeda in any way. Now, there was reason to question this conclusion at the time. Um, you know, certain things, such as the connections that the 7-7 the seven -seven attackers had made, suggested that there were more organizational ties than this being entirely local and spontaneous. Um, but the notion that there was zero connection to al-Qaeda was definitively refuted uh, the following year, uh, one year later, on July 7th of 2006, when al-Qaeda released a commemorative video uh, celebrating those attacks. What the video included was not only praise for the attacks from bin Laden and Ayman al-Sawahiri, uh, but also footage of a martyrdom tape that was recorded by Muhammad Sadiq Khan. Uh, Al-Qaeda's leadership simply could not have obtained this footage had the plot proceeded completely independent of them. Now, uh, I'm not saying that, that this was, uh, there was command and control by Al-Qaeda's central leadership. I don't think the facts bear that out. But at the very, very least, they do bear out that these guys uh, went over to training camps in Pakistan, uh, prepared for the attacks there. Uh, and at the very least, this was an al-Qaeda-sanctioned plot. They had advanced knowledge. Uh, underscoring this point, Zawahiri uh, said on the tape that uh, both Muhammad Sadiq Khan and also his fellow plotter, Shazad Tanweer, uh, had visited one of al-Qaeda's camps seeking martyrdom. I think uh, Bob Ayers, who was a security expert at London's Chatham House think tank, uh, put it best when he said about the new video, it makes the police look pretty bad. It means that the investigation was either wrong or else they identified links but were reluctant to reveal them. Uh, there was then a second event uh, which further undermined the view uh, that al-Qaeda had been rendered irrelevant. Uh, this was a major plot disrupted in August 2006, which was designed to blow up seven planes bound for the United States from Britain with liquid explosives. Uh, this had a number of links uh, back to Pakistan and served as a powerful sign that al-Qaeda was back. Um, probably the, the largest uh, post-9-11 plot that the organization was able to uh, put together, albeit a plot that fortunately uh, did not succeed. Uh, even though some initial reports uh, hesitated in linking the plot to the jihadi group's senior leadership, uh, the evidence soon left little doubt. And we can see how uh, national intelligence estimates from 2006 to 2007, representing the consensus view of the intelligence community, ended up shifting. In 2006, uh, the national intelligence estimate held that the jihadi movement was diffuse, lacked leadership, strategy, and the like. By 2007, uh, there was a very different tune. The National Intelligence Estimate in 2007, coming after, uh, coming after these events, uh, held that Al-Qaeda had protected or regenerated key elements of its homeland attack capability. Uh, what we can see again is that there was a consensus in place that ended up being proven wrong. Uh, Al-Qaeda was ruled to be dead, organizationally irrelevant, at a time when it was actually on the mend. It hadn't become an idea. Instead, it remained an organization. And the notion that it no longer was one helped to
We dropped you again. having some connection difficulty. If you can just stand by, we'll see if we can get our speaker back online. All right, here I am. Uh, there with, we go. With apologies, with apologies for these connectivity problems, I'm not sure uh, what the uh, what the issue is. Um, so okay, so we've we've been with a couple of interruptions uh, through both of these uh, case studies. Um, we can see that that this phenomenon has occurred in other areas. Um, one where a strong consensus exists, uh, but there's insufficient evidence to support it. Uh, we can see this, for example, in the case of Iraqi WMDs, where you certainly had people who uh, held that uh, it was unlikely that Iraq had a WMD program, but where you had a strong consensus in the other direction. Uh, we can see in the case of AQ Khan in Pakistan that there was a large body of literature uh, before he went around serving as a proliferator holding that no country would share its nuclear weapons expertise with others. Um, and we can even see more recently a second mistake in about al-Qaeda's organizational structure. Um, in 2011, uh, prior to uh, the raid that killed bin Laden, uh, people underestimated the degree of linkage between bin Laden and a number of uh, other affiliates within the organization. Now, uh, these consensus views are, are not without consequence. Uh, when we look, for example, at the uh, at last year's U.S. military intervention in Libya, one of the purposes, uh, one of the strategic purposes, was to speed up the Arab revolutions, which at the time seemed to have stalled. Um, certainly, uh, the then consensus view that the revolutions were good for the U.S. because they were devastating for America's jihadi foes helped to cement the decision to undertake military action. Now, regardless of one's view of the Libya intervention, and there are certainly uh, very fair arguments in favor of it, uh, the fact that one of the rationales for military action direction uh, ended up to uh, significantly undermine U.S. strategic interests. I mean, when, when I look at uh, the field, uh, there are other areas where I think consensus errors may be likely. Um, one, for example, is uh, when you look at um, so-called revisions that different jihadi groups have entered into, uh, both the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group and also Gama al-Islamiyah in Egypt, uh, analysts tend to think that um, these revisions made by imprisoned leadership, uh, which renounce uh, violence or uh, renounce connections to al-Qaeda, will hold up. To me, that's not self-evident. Uh, the decimation of al-Qaeda's core, uh, another consensus view that's held, uh, may end up being held too long. Uh, the reason being, uh, in the past, we didn't see when the group was regenerating. That may well end up being the case this time as well. Um, the notion that uh, Islamist groups will be moderated once in power, um, that's one that is fairly widespread within the field. It's currently being challenged uh, in Egypt, for example, where we can see a massive power grab on Mohammed Mursi's part. Um, the notion that the Taliban uh, won't support al-Qaeda anymore uh, after the US leaves Afghanistan because it has too much to lose is another thing that may end up be being proved wrong. Um, within my own field of international relations, there's a view which generally is not held by practitioners which is that religious ideas are uh, epiphenomena when it, uh, that is uh, rather marginal uh, pretext when it comes to jihadi groups. Uh, within uh, my field of international relations, I think that's quite wrong. But again, amongst practitioners, that's not an argument that has uh, quite as much stock. Uh, what I'd like to do uh, quickly, because I want to get to the questions, there's already some very interesting questions out there, is, is look at the reason why. Uh, why is it that this happens within these, this field? And the, the primary reason uh, I'd like to focus on is that it's a field, it's, it, it's an epistemological reason. This is a field where a lot of information is needed to reach an informed judgment. Um, a, a lot of the information that is needed to reach an informed judgment is hidden. Uh, information is hidden not only by government classifications, 
but also by the nature of the adversary. Violent non-state actors inherently attempt to obscure their organizational structure and actions. And sometimes analysts whose main focus is group propaganda or announcements don't realize the limitations of the data that they have. Um, second, because of that, sometimes selective releases of information uh, for those working in the open source can create misleading impressions and further the possibility of consensus errors. Uh, we can see this, for example, in uh, the documents that were released uh, this year to West Point's Combating Terrorism Center. And subsequently, a number of analysts inferred a great deal from what was missing in those documents. Uh, you're looking at the documents to uh, infer quite a bit more than what 17 documents really should tell us. Uh, a third thing is that I think analysts uh, often reach conclusions that fall outside of their core areas of expertise. Uh, the study of political economy, for example, is not the same as, the as security studies, which is not the same as anthropology, or not the same as the study of theology. Yet people often are uh, reaching conclusions that cross-cut these fields and uh, don't necessarily notice where their knowledge is dropping off. Uh, a fourth thing is I think you get some circular analysis. It's, a, it's similar to the phenomenon in journal journalism of circular reporting. Uh, that is, you know, a claim All right, I, I'm, I'm getting a little tired of the, uh, the, the uh, connectivity problem, so I'll just go through this fairly quickly. Uh, circular, uh, circular analysis, where you know, a claim is uh, made, such as Al-Qaeda is dead because of the Arab Spring uprisings, which then gets recirculated, uh, not so much on the basis of the underlying information, but the prestige of that particular analyst. Uh, you have the personalization of analytic differences, something I spoke of before, referring back to uh, my own experiences last summer. And then sometimes cults of personality will arise in the field. Um, I think that, that it's important to understand the tendency uh, within this field for consensus error. Uh, it's something that has very much undermined uh, the efficacy uh, of the field in certain ways. And given the way our analysis can drive policy, uh, it's important to understand this dynamic in order to get it right. So I guess with that, uh, I'll just go to uh, the questions that you all have put forward uh, on the chat and um, go through them one by one. Great, and uh, don't feel too bad. The audio is not that bad. I think we're 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 mushing along. Uh, okay. First. The first off is, uh, do you think the assumption that, that we have of Al-Qaeda's uh, irrelevance due to the the lack of attraction or the, the lack of our understanding for true attraction or the lack of attraction that Al-Qaeda Al holds among the North African Arab populations? Uh, I, th I think that's uh, one of the things there. I mean, I'll, I'll say, I'll look at, I'll answer this on, on two levels. Uh, one is, uh, I think that our perspective of the attraction Al-Qaeda holds um, is a little bit distorted uh, in multiple ways. The first is, as I said earlier, Al-Qaeda has always been a vanguard movement. So it shouldn't be surprising if a vanguard movement doesn't have widespread support, you know, that it doesn't have you know, 40, 50, 60 percent support within a society. Um, you know, even though we know that it's a vanguard movement, uh, we inferred a great deal in the fact that it wasn't, you know, that you didn't have uh, a large number of Al-Qaeda banners out there during the course of the uprisings in Tunisia, Egypt, and the like. Um, the second thing is, uh, I think our on-the-ground perspective isn't great. You know, we, do, we, we are blessed with a number of people who travel to the region frequently, know the region fairly well. But they're normally, like the people who they normally liaise with, even though you know, they'll liaise with officials or you know, liaise with man, the man on the street, they're normally not liaising with Al-Qaeda supporters. Moreover, um, if they do, people who support Al-Qaeda often aren't going to say that, uh, they're, you know, particularly those who are a little bit more sophisticated or are familiar uh, with the West. So I think that, that, that those two factors together 
you know, that we underestimated what it means for it to be a vanguard movement. That uh, analysts who go over don't really liaise with core supporters for the organization. Um, and you know, a, a third thing as well, which is that we inferred a lot into uh, the lack of Al Qaeda or jihadi presence during these protests. Those together combined uh, to what I think is, is is a large analytic error. One thing that you can clearly see has surprised analysts is the rise of Salafi parties within Egypt and the great deal of popular support that, that the Al-Nur party enjoyed in particular, as well as uh, the rise of Salafi parties in Tunisia. And I'll say that, that the strength of Salafism in Tunisia, as, as someone who spent some time there, uh, is actually something that surprised me. Um, you know, I, I didn't expect Salafi movements to be quite as strong uh, and quite as uh, virulent from the very outset uh, as they've ended up being, really putting a strain on traditional secularism uh, in Tunisia. And so, so this gets back to the epistemological point that I made, which is we have to be aware of multiple alternatives and can't rest too much in our own conventional wisdom, which is, I think, part of what happened at the beginning of the Arab Spring, when people overestimated the secularism of these societies. Uh, and I think that, that, that part of that is because of knowledge limitations. Um, a second reason is I think we generally like to see societies as quite secularized, um, but that's you know, not always going to be the case. We can't analyze based on our aspirations. Okay. Uh, here's another question is, if Al-Qaeda is more like an organized crime organization with a popular anti-modernism appeal than an attack on Arab democracy, how is the Arab Spring relevant to its future? I think the Arab Spring is relevant to its future because uh, it changes the playing field in those countries that have had revolutions. If you look at Egypt, during the 1990s, the Mubarak regime had a strategy for dealing with militant Islamic groups. Um, and you know, one may think that the strategy was overly uh, oppressive, one may like the strategy, but the fact is that it had a strategy that was fairly, that, that, that was fairly effective. Um, it was a strategy that involved uh, getting uh, people that the regime regarded as militant Islamists out of the educational system. Uh, they sacked a large number of teachers. Um, clearing out militant preachers from mosques, and policing the borders, um, as well as undertaking a domestic clampdown. That's a, poli that, that's a set of policies that has completely changed now. Uh, for one thing, you know, one of the groups that bore the brunt of some of the anti-Islamism policies of Mubarak was the Muslim Brotherhood, which is now in charge in the country. There's going to be a lot more freedom at the educational level and at the level of mosque leadership uh, for people with militant ideas uh, to gain quite a following. Uh, further, uh, though it's engaged in some counterterrorism efforts, uh, it seems as though Egypt is not keeping anybody imprisoned. Uh, you have people with a great deal of blood on their hands. You know, previous leaders of Gama al Islamiyah uh, and uh, also Egyptian Islamic Jihad who've been released. Um, and we can see also Ayman al Zawahiri's brother, uh, Muhammad Zawahiri. Uh, is has been released and is very vocally supportive of Al Qaeda, uh, so it makes a difference in terms of the operating environment. Um, not and and let's put this at two levels. One is the operational level, where uh, these groups, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, have previously imprisoned members with a significant talent pool back out on the street. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there's more of a flow of weaponry from Libya. Uh, which, at least in the short term, may increase the operational capabilities. Uh, and also, I would add to that, within some of the, the post-Arab Spring chaos, in Libya, for example, uh, you now have fairly effective training facilities up and running uh, in the eastern Libyan desert, for example. So there's operational capabilities, but the second one, which may prove to be more important in the long term, is simply the opportunity to really spread milita the militant understanding of the faith. Um, I spent a lot of time looking into uh, the jihadi perceptions of the Arab Spring. I actually just have a piece out in the Studies in Conflict and Terrorism uh, on this. It came out this month. If any of you are interested in reading it, feel free to email me. I'm happy to send you a PDF of this piece. Uh, but one thing that, that amongst uh, jihadis looking at the Arab Spring events is a widespread view, is that they suddenly have a great deal 
more of Dawa opportunities. They're going to be able to evangelize for their interpretation of the faith in a way that they couldn't do previously. And they think that this is something that's going to help their understanding uh, to really uh, gain much more of a following uh, within the region. So, so that's how the Arab Spring uh, is, is, is relevant. I mean, there's also one final way, if you look at it not from the opportunities, but from their goals, uh, they still have a goal of regime change. Uh, this is something that, that, that's quite clear. Now, whether they're going to try to do that in the short term or the long term is a significant question. In places like Egypt, uh, and uh, I would say that they're not going to really undertake a, a great deal of militant activity in the short term, uh, because if they do so, that could interfere with their ability to make dawah. In other places, um, you know, there, there's more of a, a desire to take and hold territory. In uh, Yemen, for example, you can see that, that up until a few months ago, Ansar al-Sharia, which is a front group for al-Qaeda, was able to hold territory uh, in uh, the Abiyan province. Uh, but they still have a goal of, of regime change. Uh, and so you know, to that extent, uh, the Arab Spring, uh, the new Arab Spring governments um, aren't going to be you know, more legitimate in their eyes, uh, but they uh, may, for example, think that they have new opportunities for combating uh, these governments, as well as uh, some new dangers. Okay, so if the if this uh, narrative about how uh, Al Qaeda is dead, sort of the the reports of their death are a little bit exaggerated, uh, what kind of understanding of of Al Qaeda should replace it? Specifically, thinking back towards during the Reagan era, the how the Soviet Union uh, we had a distinct uh, view of their standing, and then it changed so quickly uh, after after the, the the wall fell and that sort of thing. So, how is this Al Qaeda is dead narrative? What should replace it? I think for one thing, and the Soviet Union is a great example there, um, what we should have been aware of during the Cold War era is uh, simply the gaps in our own knowledge. Um, now, you know, the, the, there obviously is, is still an enormous academic debate about what the primary factors uh, causing the end of the Cold War were, uh, whether it was Gorbachev, uh, whether it was uh, financial, whether it was uh, the Soviet Union's unwillingness to intervene uh, in East, East Europe the way it did um, previously. Uh, there's a significant debate, but it, it definitely took analysts within the field by surprise, uh, just like the Herb Spring has taken analysts by surprise. I think we need to be more attuned to what possibilities are, and we need to be more attuned to what we do not know. And in the case of Al-Qaeda, you know, it's an organization where we can, A, look at how they worked in the past, and B, understand that there's a large aspect of network dynamics that we simply cannot see. Uh, we can see our, the, the attrition we inflict upon the organization. We can see its output in terms of terrorist plots or the lack thereof. Uh, but we don't have a great understanding of how much attrition will destroy the network, for example. I think understanding gaps in, the knowledge is, in our knowledge is one important thing. I think a second important thing is understanding the enemy's perception. We do not do a good job with that. And I can say, you know, in this debate about was Al-Qaeda dead, uh, this debate that, that, that uh, kicked off with the Arab Spring events, uh, one where, uh, as I said before, most analysts, uh, at least in early 2011, uh, fell on the side of Al-Qaeda being dead, rendered irrelevant, or significantly weakened. Um, within the debate, Al-Qaeda's own voice didn't play a significant role. Uh, Al-Qaeda's own voice was very much marginalized. And uh, that's always problematic, because if you're trying to understand what an impact on uh, an enemy force is going to be, you have to understand how that enemy views the world and how that enemy thinks developments are going to affect it. Certainly, the enemy definitely has a voice in this. Uh, so to kind of wrap up and, and put a, a fine point on this. What is it that analysts can do? And most of our, our viewer, our, our participants here are analysts. What is it that analysts can do to avoid the problem of this false consensus that you've identified? I think that, that this slide uh, that's currently up on, on the why also does a good job of encapsulating some of the how. Uh, we need to be aware of the limits of our own knowledge. In looking at epistemological issues and understanding 
where there are things we don't know is very important. And when someone questions a consensus view, um, with you know, with a uh, in an area where everybody is assuming one thing, but another thing should be correct, I think that we have to be open to those analytic possibilities. That means we can't have an environment where differences are personalized, uh, where people who see things a little bit differently are shunted to the margins or uh, are told that their ideas are somehow illegitimate or offensive. That absolutely cannot happen because that is devastating uh, to good analysis. A third thing is, uh, you know, as, as I note in this slide, uh, analysts often reach conclusions that fall outside their core areas of expertise. Uh, I think that, that, that one reason that that happens is because there are multiple methodologies that are being used uh, to uh, analyze current developments. It really is a, an area that demands a synthesis of knowledge. And being able to develop uh, better regional analytic methodologies uh, will help to check those areas where there's a consensus view that uh, isn't really warranted uh, by the evidence. I'd say, say those are three things. And you know, the fourth and final thing is be very attuned to what proof is underlying a claim. You know, often you'll have a lot of claims that are put forward strongly where when you look at it, the proof just really isn't there. So if there's an important assumption being made, we always have to ask why. And sometimes the why is clear. And sometimes a consensus view is very warranted. But there are also times where it isn't. And what our field has not done a good job of over the course of the past decade is recognizing those times when the evidence does not justify the consensus that's in place. And I think this, uh, this final slide that you have up here is a good thing that probably everybody ought to print off and put in their, in their workspace. Uh, pretty good call against falling into these sorts of traps. Mm -hmm.